Hey there, welcome to Black Umbo Southern Gardening. It's time for question and answer episode 22. All right, let's get on with our questions for our 22nd episode of Question and Answer. Uh, Catherine Randall says, my plants look healthy and strong. You mentioned that they need to be fed now. Does the soil you were given provide all what is needed? She says she's an obvious newbie here. Uh, a similar question by Larry Borkowski. Did you use the half and half soil mixture with all your seed starting, or do you use 100% seed starting soil when you start seeds in smaller modules? Well, let's go over the seed table and I'll talk about that. When starting seeds, what you put in your seed starting container is going to depend on the size of the container and how long you expect your plant to stay in there. A little container like this, or if you're starting seeds in like a Jiffy seed tray or a seed tray from Haas Tools that has those really small cells, I fill those just with seed starting mix. The reason is the plant doesn't need a bunch of nutrition uh, while it's spending time in those really small cells because what you're probably going to do is come through and select the strongest ones and pot them up in a larger pot um, until they go out in the garden and that allows you to do some selection. Uh, or you might be uh, growing those in tiny little cells and putting them directly in the garden and you'll have a high volume of seed starts but once they get in the garden they've got access to nutrition because they're put in, in the soil there. If you're going to start your plants and you expect them to spend a lot of time in these little pots, for example my peppers, uh, they're going to spend some time in pots because it's not warm enough to plant them out yet. Then what you might want to do is put a little bit of compost or potting mix that has compost in it in the bottom half of your larger container and then put seed starting mix on top. And what that does is it saves money, it saves uh, resources, you don't have to buy an expensive compost or potting soil to start your seeds in. Um, you can start your seeds in that very fine potting mi uh, seed starting mix on the top. It's specifically for seed starting mix. It holds on to moisture, it's ground up very fine, and it doesn't have a lot of nutrition in it because the plants don't need it at that point. But once their roots get halfway down this container and the plant gets a little bit taller and it needs that nutrition for photosynthesis, if it's got some compost down in the bottom, you're set. You don't have to pot this up. You can just leave it in this pot until it gets, you know, yay so big and then pot it out in the garden. Let me show you why you don't need a bunch of nutrition in seed starting mix. Let's go look at some seeds, uh, some seedlings. I want you to take a look at these tomato seedlings. When these seedlings come up, you see these two leaves. They're very thin and they're not very tomato-like whatsoever. As you can see, they are cotyledons. And you can see on this one, I don't know if you can see, let me zoom in. You can see on this one that there is a seed husk at the tip of this leaf. That's very common, you'll see that. That is a cotyledon also. Cotyledon is the embryonic leaves. They're the first two leaves you get on a plant. And these are like an egg yolk. They have all the nutrition stored up in that little leaf that the plant is going to need to get by while in this seed starting mixture. So when you have larger seeds like uh, brassicas, squash, the cotyledons will be even larger. Let me show you. Check this guy out. This is a zucchini that's coming up and you can see these first two leaves are the seed leaves or the cotyledons. These two leaves have everything that plant needs to uh, to grow its first set of true leaves. Once you get into true leaves, once you start seeing leaves that look like squash leaves, that's when your plant is moving over into photosynthesis in order to provide nutrition for itself. It will collect light, it will draw nutrition from the soils and together those two will provide the plant with the nutrition it needs. Once you get true leaves you need to start fertilizing. Very very weak mixture of fish emulsion is all I do on these seedlings. So cotyledons, they bring the seed up, they have all the nutrition it needs, the plant doesn't even really need to do photosynthesis at this point, but as soon as those true leaves start to form, and you'll see them coming out of the out of the middle of the plant there, as soon as those true leaves start to form, then the plant is going to need nutrition. Here's an example of true leaves. On this tomato plant, 
These are the true leaves. They look like tomato leaves, but you can still see down here uh, the cotyledons are still there. These little leaves were the original seed leaves, the cotyledons, and yeah, they, they're still there. But the plant's not really using these so much. It's using these leaves to collect light and to use that light to convert nutrients in the soil uh, to food for the plant. Those are true leaves. Proprietary Cures asks, have you tried beneficial nematodes for vine borers? Well, <clears throat> every year I grow squash, the vine borer pressure increases. And that's because the more squash you grow and the more vine pressure, uh, the more vine borers you have in your garden, well, they're laying eggs. They're dropping eggs all over the place. And what happens is that moth comes and lays eggs on your squash. The eggs uh, hatch and there's a little caterpillar and that caterpillar bores into your vine and begins munching on your vine from the inside and kills your plant. And there's a lot of different things you can do for vine borers. I've got lots of videos on how to deal with them. Um, but one thing you can do is head them off at the pass by using beneficial nematodes. And yes, um, I do intend to try beneficial nematodes this year. In about two weeks, I'm gonna be clearing these beds and getting ready for spring planting. And at that point, I will be amending these beds and I will also be treating with beneficial nematodes. Biological insect control, beneficial nematodes. Controls cutworms, fire ants, that's a good bonus, fleas, and grub worms. And it's also said to control uh, vine borer moth pupa. So we'll see. And what these beneficial nematodes do, these nematodes are little microscopic worms, and they feed on the pupa of various kinds of grubs in the soil, including the vine borer uh, pupa. So we hope to limit that vine borer action with beneficial nematodes. So yes, we're gonna try it. Hopefully it'll work and I'll show you how I do it and whether or not it works. Man, the aircraft are flying. A weird pattern today, right in the middle of my video. <laughs> okay, our viewer, Ralph. Hey Ralph, how you doing? Asks, is it too late to plant tom tomatoes from seeds? He's in Corpus Christi, thanks. Corpus Christi, you're probably zone 9B, maybe even zone 10 a little bit south from here a couple hours so uh, no it's not too late it's never too late to plant tomatoes in the spring here's the problem though the the it becomes too late when you look at your to ma your uh, seed packet and you look at the maturity date and if that maturity date brings you into hot summer weather if you're going to plant seeds and it's going to be consistently above you know say 85 90 degrees in your area um, it's probably too late then so get your calendar out Look at your average temperatures of your area and if you've got enough time to bring tomato plants to maturity before the weather gets really hot then i would say go for it here's the deal tomato plants don't pollinate well in high heat there are some heat loving varieties there are some types that are supposedly uh, heat tolerant uh, i grew one called the juliet tomato it was a little cherry tomato i didn't like it though because the um, the skins on those things were so tough but uh, there are varieties that manage the heat well. Everglades tomato is a tiny little candy-like cherry tomato. It's supposed to it's supposed to handle the heat well. I'll let you know if I can get some to grow. But uh, yeah, tomato plants, they'll blossom. They'll put on flowers and you'll think, wow, I'm going to have a lot of fruit. But, if, uh, but tomato plants require a specific temperature. It needs to be all below, below 90 degrees, definitely. Most varieties below 85 degrees. And the nighttime temperature is important as well. So do some research on the variety you have and see if you've got time to plant them. I think you got time now. Next question, Deborah Ransom asks, do the cardboard cylinders hold up when you get rain? And she's talking about celery blanching. Well, here they are, they're holding up. We've had a lot of rain and they're doing just fine. Um, cardboard's pretty resilient in terms of uh, staying, you know, it's not like paper that'll fall apart. If you wrap these in newspaper, maybe the rain will give you problems. That's why I chose cardboard. Uh, you can see they're doing quite well. The celery's growing nice and healthy. Got a little frost damage from the freezes we had, even though I covered them. Um, but they're looking good. I'm real interested to see what's down in this cardboard to see if the blanching is uh, having its effect. What we want to do when we blanch celery is bundle it up like this and put it in these cylinders so that no sunlight can get to the stalks. And that will make those stalks turn lighter in color. They won't be so densely green and they will be a little more sweet and tender instead of bitter. Uh, that's why we blanch our celery. So yeah, there it is. It's rained a lot around here and the cardboard's holding up just fine. 
Right back there you can see my nasty fetid swamp water brew that's going on. That's an anaerobic uh, compost tea kind of thing. Uh, I've got a whole video about it. Pretty controversial because a lot of people think it's dangerous. A lot of people think that, uh, you know, it's going to hurt your garden or something. Uh, do some research and you'll find that digestion, anaerobic digestion, been around for thousands of years and it's perfectly safe if you take the proper safety precautions in using it. I mean, don't drink the stuff. Don't put it on your lettuce and then harvest it the same day. You know, treat it, treat it like, uh, like it is. It's uh, anaerobic. That bacteria doesn't go well with humans. You got to let that anaerobic bacteria go into your garden and have time for the oxygen in the air, the oxygen in the soil to oxidize those bacteria, kill them off. The aerobic bacteria that's natural in your soil will go to town on those anaerobic bacteria, eat them, kill them. You won't have any trouble. Um, a lot of people have asked, you know, do you have any problems with um, uh, methane gas? And well, yeah, it's, it's methane. It stinks and it is flammable if you don't vent your system and you don't have, you know, a seepage path for that gas to escape. But uh, yeah, do some research. It's been uh, something we use, uh, the gardeners have used a long time. So, but the question is, Carmen Mendez asks, why not add peels, bananas, apples, oranges, citrus, potatoes, eggshells, so, so and so. Why not add this to your uh, compost barrel and get that nutrition back? Well, let's go over and, and I'll tell you why. Get ready. Shoo. What we have here is mostly weeds and greens. And you can see there's scum on the top of the water. There's a pretty rich smell here. And what we have down in here is some good compost tea. This is not stuff you'd want to use and put in your garden if you're going to eat your plants right away. This is breaking down uh, anaerobically and you're basically using this to get the nutrition back from the weeds in your garden and garden refuse that you won't put in your compost pile. I wouldn't put all the banana, you, you can, all those things that Carmen asked about, you can put them in here. You can let them rot down and become fetid and that will work. But this is for my weeds that I, I can't put in my compost pile because they've already gone to seed and my compost pile doesn't often get the the proper temperatures, it doesn't maintain a consistent temperature throughout the entire pile that I can be sure that those seeds are killed off. So all that goes into here, I get that back by rotting it down anaerobically and all that nutrition from those weeds in my garden and uh, diseased leaves and stuff, they, well they go in here. That's what this is for. But all of those other items, banana peels, eggshells, kitchen scraps, uh, old meat, anything, cheese, milk, any anything like that goes into my regular hot compost pile because there I'm building compost out of a lot of nutritious things that benefit from the aerobic breakdown and feed that aerobic breakdown and help keep it going. So things like my greens, the nitrogen rich stuff, kitchen scraps, coffee grounds, things like that, uh, plant, plant refuse that is not going in here like carrot tops, uh, radish tops, they go in the, in the main compost bin over there. And then on top of those we mix in our carbons leaves, uh, paper shreds, that's the ones I use most, egg cartons, the fibrous egg cartons, those go in there as well. And the combination of those builds good compost. So we've got both kinds going, don't worry about this stuff, you know, I'm not putting my, my quality materials in here. This is regaining the nutrition from the weeds in the garden. Okay, our next question for, comes from Patty Mulcahy. Patty asks, Scott, could you please suggest a radish that I can grow that isn't spicy. I can't do anything spicy, even mild spicy. All right, Patty, I got two radishes for you. Number one is the Malaga radish. It's a purple radish on the outside. It's a traditional small radish about the size of a, well, about the size of a smaller than a ping pong ball. And they are delicious flesh, white meat, clear inside. I mean, hardly any spice to them at all. I reviewed those in a video uh, in the past. I'll try to dig it up and find it. There's another radish that's not too spicy. It's this one here. It's the daikon radish. This is an enormous radish. And if you buy daikon radishes, you'll find that they're not as spicy as regular radishes. In fact, even the spiciest variety of daikon radish that I've found is very mild compared to regular table radishes or breakfast radishes. Uh, these guys are beautiful white inside. 
They're very versatile. You can use them as traditional radishes, but they've got a lot of other uses. I have a video on a couple of ways I prepare daikon radish. Uh, this is not spicy. This particular one is a, a winter storage radish. That's its variety. It's not spicy hardly at all. And I got this at Kitazawa Seed. So, yeah, these guys, man, these are quite nice. So, going back to my other question, all these greens from this radish, I don't eat the radish greens. These will be going into my regular compost pile, not into my... Um, fermentation pile because well that's quality clean stuff doesn't have any seeds in it does not disease got a little frost damage but hey this is good nitrogen for my regular compost bin so that's where this will go daikon radishes try them next question judy siegman i hope i pronounced your name right judy judy asks will broccoli and cauliflower that i cut will it regrow yes this is the broccoli that I harvested, you, you might be able to see the inside cut there. Um, I cut that down and took the main head out because it started to bolt a bit because of our unseasonably warm weather. You can see that it puts out small florets here and there. And I'm quite impressed. There's a lot of it coming on all over the plant. So I've got a whole nother head's worth of broccoli in these smaller florets now. So if you cut your broccoli, don't pull the whole plant up unless you've just got a diseased plant. So just cut it and come back and if there's enough time if the weather's right well you can get yourself a whole bunch more goodness like this maybe you can see in there where i cut it right there that's where the broccoli head used to be yeah it's a lot more broccoli coming in huh not bad all right i've got some follow-ups um some upcoming video info and some updates uh, so the question and answer session was kind of short. Sorry about that. Man, this wind is crazy today. Um, the aphids and the rutabagas. Somebody had asked about that, but I couldn't find your question, so I didn't include it in the Q&A. But the rutabagas suffered from an aphid attack, and just the rutabagas, not the kohlrabi on the side and the radishes on the other side, just the rutabagas. So I left them in sort of as a trap crop, knowing we had a series of freezes coming to see if the freezes would kill off the aphids. And it seems that the freezes killed off about 90% of the aphid pests. And they were heavy, but they had already done damage to many of the plants. Surprisingly, many of those rutabagas are bulking up. And I think I'll get some rutabagas this year. And they serve to keep the aphids there and out of my kohlrabi and out of my cabbages. Um, yeah, they served as a trap crop. A trap crop is any, any variety of plant, any crop that you plant specifically to trap the bugs, draw the bugs there, and keep them off of your more desirable crops. Rutabag is nice and crispy here. This is the leaf matter that was uh, damaged by the aphids. And you can see there's a few aphids remaining. There's one right there by my thumb. But there's not giant colonies like there used to be. So uh, yeah, some of the rutabagas are doing well now, recovering. But you can see in the midst of the rutabaga patch, there's this big bear area and a lot of damaged fruit. So this is an ugly, ugly part of the garden. But we don't care about that because this kept the aphids from the kohlrabi and from these radishes. And I'm still gonna get some rutabagas. There's some bulking going up down there. Let's see, there we go. You can see down there, right there. Um, here's what we're gonna do in upcoming weeks. Spring is here. And wow, have we got a lot of work to do. Uh, I've got some second year apple tree pruning to do, and I'm going to show you how to establish shape and establish a growth habit in my apple tree whips. And I might do two different kinds. I might do a modified open, open leader, and I might do an open center. It depends. I got to do a little more research on the varieties I've got and decide which one to do. But we're going to prune apple trees. And if you follow my channel for any of the pruning, you know that's a slow process. The last apple tree video we had was last spring, so this is a year by year thing. But I'll show you what I do anyway. We're also gonna prune all my fig trees and I'll show you how to do some fig tree pruning. I already have videos on that, but <clears throat> my fig trees are in such a bad state because of the freeze last spring. Didn't allow me to do a pruning on them because well, I needed to see which ones were still alive and which ones were dead. So I just kind of let them grow as they wanted to grow. So we did no pruning. That means I've got some trees that are weird and unshapely and wacky looking. This guy's all sideways. This guy's a little bushy. That's all the new growth we got after the freeze on this one. Some of my trees really grew crazy. 
you know, we got a little bit of new growth on this one. This one's off to a fairly good shape, but we need to get it ready for this next growing season. Here's an example of what happened last year. This is a yellow long neck fig, and you can see it was a big tall tree. It died back, I had to lop it off, but I didn't dig it up, I didn't throw it away. I just let it do its thing. And from the roots, you can see it grew these four branches. And what we're gonna do then is we're gonna take this one out and we're just gonna let this be a, a tri branched little bushing habit. It was a tree, it was tall and skinny and I had pruned it up the right way uh, for a tree, but we're gonna just let it grow. It looks like it wants to grow as a bush now. So we'll let it. I'll show you what we're gonna do to force out growth on these buds. Uh, sometimes you have to pinch these buds to help force out growth on the sides. But uh, this, one, this one looks like it's probably in good shape. We might just let it alone. It's hot today, I'm sweating, but I've got a hunch we've got another cold spell coming. It's not gonna freeze, but I want my plants to, I want my plants to have a good start. We're gonna start hardening off those seedlings. I'll show you how to do that. We're gonna pot some peppers. We're gonna grow a lot of plants this year in containers. I'm gonna show you how to transplant fruit trees into containers, and that will be their final container. Let me show you something. Look at these big old pots. That's awesome, 25 gallons each. I got these pots from a tip from my buddy Frank Williams. Thanks Frank. Me and Frank chat every now and then on Facebook. He follows our channel, he's up in Flint, Michigan. And these were $13 each. 13 bucks for a 25 gallon bucket. They are made for plants, food grade. Yeah man, shipping was reasonable. So I appreciate that tip Frank. Yeah, that's a lot coming up. There's a lot of stuff coming up. I'm gonna, just going to show you the everyday mundane tasks that I do in my garden, in my context, and you folks seem to like that. Uh, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'll show you what I'm doing. I'll teach you how to do things. Real basic stuff here in this teaching garden. Nothing fancy. I'm not a botanical expert, uh, but I can show you what I do. Hey, you know, I generally think that I try to be a nice guy. I try to be ethical. I try to promote other channels. I try to promote, promote products and companies that I think are doing a good job. But one of you today alerted me that Vivo Sun, Vivo Sun, you know, the ones that make the heat pads, one like I just bought, and the net trellises, Vivo Sun has robbed videos or a video off of my channel and used it in one of their marketing videos that's all over Amazon and on the internet. Didn't ask me didn't get my permission, didn't say, hey, we would like to use this video. They just stole it. They just swiped it. As a creative professional in my main career of my life, uh, this was forbidden. And if any company did this, uh, that company was considered a, a, a thief, an unethical company. But I see it more and more today. These companies just robbing stuff off of YouTube because they know uh, that in order to get anything done about it, courts are going to be involved. And YouTubers don't have tons of money to take a company to court. So what do we do about it? Well, we just get the word out. Vivo Sun. Unless they, unless they respond to my email and they respond to my, uh, my reaching out to them to see what they're going to do about this, uh, I'm just going to keep telling you guys, Vivo Sun, unethical company. Their products may be okay. Sometimes they're pretty good. I like to use them. But unless they make this right, I'm not going to use their, their products anymore. And I'm going to get the word out. So that's how you fight a company like that who th steals your material and uh, uses it without your permission. Well, hey, enough of that stuff. Uh, we're going we're gonna to get on out of here. Thanks for joining me today. I hope your garden is thriving. I hope you're doing well. I hope there are not companies stealing your stuff from you. And I hope that you have a wonderful spring. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.